I can remember in third grade or so that uh, um, uh, looking at the books that were in, in those days, you used to, everybody had an independent little desk and you'd lift it up and your books would be inside. And my science book was, I can remember it having a special place and thinking, um, boy, scientists have it made. Uh, and not really knowing what the, what the path would be, but just uh, appreciating uh, uh, what science is about at that age. Now, uh, no one in my family had anything to do with science. But um, if I look at what got me interested um, in scientific matters, I know my grandparents must have, I, I, they would give me books about uh, space exploration and things like that. There was Sputnik, you know, in 1959. You're, we'd go out in the front yard and we'd uh, say somewhere up there something's flying around. And a few years later, I think we had a big um, silver balloon called Echo, and I remember we could see that uh, go across. Uh, but I also grew up in Miami, in South Florida, and it was, you know, it's a tropical environment. We had um, all kinds of critters running around the yard. Uh, uh, a lot escaped from um, little private uh, tourist spots uh, in the area. You know, Miami was a tourist uh, destination for as long as I can remember. And there was the parrot jungle and the, the serpentarium and the monkey jungle and the orchid jungle. And so there was there were lots of exotic plants and animals uh, that tourists would pay to see, but they were in these open areas where they would, like the parrot jungle, had no roof. And so you'd walk out, I'd walk out in my backyard and there might be a, a parrot sitting in a tree. Um, um, now there were some animals that were supposed to be there. So, you know, every now and then an alligator, a small alligator might crawl up in a backyard. Uh, but it, but those were the kinds of things that uh, if I if I try to imagine what it was that got me interested in biology and science, um, I can just remember the there was this profusion of uh, of wildlife. My parents would also go down to the Keys when I was six or seven years old, and they'd come back with uh, fish they'd caught. And in those days. Uh, uh, the fish were much more plentiful and much bigger, and they I can just remember them bringing home, you know, trash cans with fish that were so big that the heads would be sticking up out of the tops of the cans. So, so those would get thrown out on the front yard, and you know, you'd go over and look at them and explore them, and and uh, uh, and so you know, those were the kinds of things that were in that mix that make you interested, I guess, in the natural world. I was surprised when I was in um, uh, graduate school and noticed this paper by Ron Kanaka and Seymour Benzer that described the first mutations that affected circadian behavior. I was surprised that everybody didn't know immediately what was meant by clock mutants uh, because I had seen um, seen that term, heard that term. Uh, we discussed that term in some of our, um, I'd seen it in books as a kid. And also, again, growing up in Miami, we, you know, there was a, the neighbor, the Clugstons next door, had all these um, odd plants uh, in their backyard. And, and in those days, you could, you know, the kids just ran through the neighborhood. There weren't any fences, nobody, you know, um, and there wasn't a leash on anybody, so any hour of the day or night, kids would be roaming around in the neighborhood. And, and uh, uh, there was a uh, plant with these big white blooms that would be, you know, we'd go over there playing some capture the flag or something at night, and these blooms would be open. And, you know, we'd realize that earlier in the day, we'd been over in that backyard, and those blooms were closed. And so that, you know, it, you knew that animals and, and uh, uh, 
I myself and every other person I knew had sleep-wake cycles, but you didn't think about plants having rhythms. And so it sort of, um, it was a curiosity at the time. Later, as you took a little bit of science in school, you heard about circadian rhythms. So I'd known about circadian rhythms for many, many years before running across the, the desire to work on these. Now, you know, I, I, I'm about where I think uh, most people would like to be. I, I, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't have a conflict where, you know, if I need to get up early, I'm not so far off by my natural inclination that I can't do that, but I can also sleep in. But as you may know, we, some of the work that we do is on night owls, and uh, so I've seen how extreme that can be, so I'm, I guess I'm a bit thankful that I... <laughs> Uh, it, interesting, one of the people in the lab that works on that problem, I think, became interested because she's an night owl, and she tells everybody she's a she's a night owl. But uh, it wasn't because of a, my interest uh, wasn't connected, for example, to the fact that I had an odd feeling clock. Um, so I'm 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 uh, I'm about in the middle of where the human population sits, I think. <laughs> So, tricks for dealing with jet lag. You know, jet lag is it, just, in thinking about what jet lag is, or, or knowing more about what jet lag uh, causes, informs how you respond. So, something that I didn't know, no one knew uh, 10 years, 15 years ago, and longer. Uh, you'd think about going from one time zone to another, and you'd think about your head having to come in tune with the new uh, time zone. Today we know that since these little circadian clocks are all over our bodies, that the real problem with jet lag is desynchrony. You've got clocks all over your body that are taking cues from different things that are happening. Some are following the sun, some are following when you eat, uh, and the clocks in different organ systems reset at different rates when you travel across time zones. And so uh, jet lag is not being out of sync, it's being desynchronized. So uh, that being the case, the, the slowest responses are from internal organs that are uh, primarily responding to food. So I think very carefully about meal times. Don't eat at night in the place that you're traveling to. So. Coming to Sweden, even though I woke up in the middle of the night uh, and I was a bit hungry, I didn't have anything to eat. You wait until it would be appropriate to eat uh, in Stockholm. And uh, as much as possible, avoid uh, exposing yourself to light uh, at you know when it's deep night. As you pointed out, what about in uh, uh, a uh, place so far north as we are that uh, there's very little sunlight each day, each, each 24-hour interval. And there you, uh, a lot of us are being exposed to our own, you know, we're turning on electric lights and we're controlling our own meal times. And so it takes a little more attention to these things, but you will synchronize yourself. You know, the, 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 the signals are more subtle than they would be. Um, Another way to look at it is what about the summer when the lights are on all the time? And of course, then we can we draw those drapes. Um, I remember being in Reykjavik and, you know, having those those real blackout curtains and really depending on them. So uh, you do have to pay attention, but you can, you know, if you if you watch your exposure to light and exercise uh, and meal times, then uh, that goes a long way toward doing it. This, this, this is, uh, uh, I've thought a lot about issues of competition and collaboration in science, uh, especially just thinking about how the subject uh, of circadian rhythms has evolved with, you know, uh, the experiments and understanding and, and trying to think about other pathways. You know, is there a better pathway to where we wound up? And in the beginning, uh, there was just this one gene to explore it, one doorway to walk through to ask questions about the origins of the biological origins of circadian rhythms. And we both had to, you know, both teams 
had to walk through that uh, doorway, the two Brandeis teams at, and, and our team at Rockefeller. And so there was a lot of con competition uh, in the b beginning because there were a series of questions you, you know, could ask and those could only be asked about that one gene. So you could say, well, let's find the gene, let's identify it. Let's identify what it does. Is it making a protein? We didn't even know that in the beginning. How do the mutations affect the way that gene is operating? They wound up, the mutations affected the structure of the protein. That was a, an important clue uh, because they were qualitatively changing the protein, which meant you could get fast and slow clocks from, from changes in, subtle changes in the structure. But, you know, we were asking the same questions, at, so there was a lot of uh, racing uh, associated with that because you wanted to get things to the next stage. But then we, we realized after uh, a good deal of work on this one gene that it was going to be really hard to figure out uh, to deeply understand the system by studying just one gene. Uh, this is a complex behavior. Surely there must be other genes uh, involved. And so we began screening. Um, and uh, it was very difficult initially to find other significant mutations. Uh, but we finally found uh, a second gene, which was called timeless, which turned out to be a partner for period. and told us much more about what period was doing than we had understood from studying period alone. So we realized that that kind of an approach could be extremely valuable. And uh, the, the, the realization that other genes could be found and could tell you a lot about each other uh, got us all saying, let's go look for more genes. And after you've got 10 or 12 genes and see how they um, interconnect, then you really did see a mechanism emerge. And had we not been competing in the beginning and looking for ways to distinguish ourselves, uh, you know, if just one group were working on this, we might still be just working on period. But uh, I think uh, because of the pressure to find something that would take you in a, a different direction, we went to the other genes. And then we had uh, an amplification that occurred. So the Brandeis group would find a gene over here, we'd find another gene, they would, our gene would make sense to them and theirs would make sense to us. So we began to put our pieces together and, and th then things really began to unfold in a wonderful way. And so I think competition has its, you know, it's uncomfortable. In the beginning, every new young scientist thinks, well, how am I ever going to get some traction here? Uh, you know, I, uh, how, how, how am I going to distinguish myself? But um, it, it uh, you know, looking back on it, it drove us to search more broadly. And, uh, and then once, and then we entered a whole new realm of uh, cooperative work that I think uh, made this whole uh, picture uh, fall out in a wonderful way. Yes, uh, I know there are some companies that are working on small molecules uh, uh, that apparently have gone through uh, some clinical trials and seem to be uh, pretty effective. None of those are, are beyond the trial uh, stage, but everything we know, one of the values of knowing how these clocks work is that you know what the pieces are composed of. And so all of those pieces are potential targets for, uh, for therapy. There's another way of looking at this too, because uh, there are certain things that uh, we from time to time want to do when we have a normally running clock, but uh, we're suffering from jet lag and we want some relief. Uh, that's one kind of a problem, but another kind of problem is if you don't have a perfectly running clock, and we're learning that many individuals don't. They're genetically determined to have a clock that runs slightly out of kilter uh, with uh, with the natural with the 24-hour uh, cycle. Um, for example, one of the genes we've worked on recently, we found a, a change that's present in about one percent of the population worldwide and it causes the clock to run slightly uh, too slow relative to a 24-hour cycle. 
longer than 24 hours, and it produces a big, it produces night owl behavior. And those uh, individuals that have that pattern, for some, they're fine with it, but others, it creates a, a great deal of stress. They have social and work obligations that make this a really very difficult. And, you know, I, uh, we, we've, we've heard from some of these individuals the kinds of tricks they try to play on themselves to, to, uh, to keep up with a job that has an early morning uh, demand to it. In those cases, when you know not only the parts, but you know what the defective or the change is, the variation is, then it's possible to think about therapies that would specifically act on that variant target. And this is something that many uh, scientists have talked about uh, for many years in, for different biological pathways. So I think in cases like this, it may be possible to have a, a uh, if you're dealing with 1% of the population, it might be quite valuable to try to develop something that would act specifically on just, just to correct the problem uh, and not to have an effect on uh, wider operations of this, uh, this clock-like machinery. Yeah, so the question of the relationship of clocks to lifespan or health span is something that we're looking at now using Drosophila. We, while we, we've always studied Drosophila and we've recently begun to do a number of human studies, we still look to Drosophila when we're asking some really basic questions like this. One of the things that we've been, um, uh, that we're uh, beginning to see is a, a close relationship between sleep need and lifespan. So for example, um, one of the th ways that we can in improve sleep, even in, a, in a, a, what we would call the wild type fly, a normal fly, would be to control the access to food for the fruit fly. So uh, it seems incredible, but uh, if you just, we're so used to giving fruit flies access to food at any time they want it. You know, they're raised on a medium, on a, on a, on a food medium. Uh, but we find that if we make that food available for only 12 hours a day during the times of day when the animal should be active, the animals do live longer. They have longer lifespans. More importantly, they seem to have longer health spans. So they seem to, they seem to have a, a point uh, where they uh, will die off at about the same rate that uh, flies with access to food always have. Or, flies with uh, access to food all the time have, but it's delayed. So it's a health span uh, uh, improvement. And uh, interestingly, it looks like that flies that are genetically uh, altered so that they have defects in the amount of sleep they get each uh, night, uh, those animals seem to be helped the most by controlling when they uh, eat. So I. I think we need to learn much more about this. This, this kind of phenomenon has been seen in mammals as well, uh, but I think there are, are very positive uh, effects that, that uh, don't require a drug. They just require some uh, attention to be paid to the fact that we are rhythmic organisms, and those rhythms uh, can help us. If we help the rhythms, they'll pay us back. Well, yeah, uh, for the past, past few years, I think Michael Rosbash uh, has told me he, he's uh, been experimenting with this too, and that is don't eat at night after a certain hour. Uh, when I get up in the morning, I generally go out and exercise, take a three-mile walk in the morning, and then I'll sit down and have some breakfast, and then I'll, I'll uh, so I might be eating at nine o'clock or so in the morning. And then uh, uh, dinner will be at uh, 7 30 8 o'clock and then no more eating water is fine you know drink a drink of water at, at night but uh, uh, you know I'm it's not really an experiment because you know uh, I only have one lifetime to measure but uh, the uh, the results in the animal models are so so far so clear-cut that I think it's 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 worthwhile paying attention to this. Also, you know, there is, um, there, there are so many metabolic 
uh, diseases that we're seeing in the ar arising in uh, different populations around the world that don't seem to reflect changes in genetics. It's too recent. You know, you don't uh, the, the the population genetics hasn't changed, and so there must be something uh, uh, environmental or behavioral that's contributing to this. And so this may be one of the important contributing factors. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I hadn't thought about that. Uh, is this a sixth, you know, is it like a sixth sense? But yes, I guess it is to, to the extent that we're hardwired to do this and we are ourselves are, are aware of the turning of the earth uh, and become reacquainted every day as the sun goes up and the sun goes down. Uh, you know, we have programs of gene activity that are dictated by these clocks in every cell. Uh, and that, uh, uh, where hundreds of genes are turning on and off with tremendous regularity and at different, it's not just swinging back and forth, it's different hours. Every hour of the day, there's a different combination of gene activities. So if you lost that sense, you would lose the ability to orchestrate all of that uh, uh, gene expression timing. So, yeah, it, it's it's uh, it's an interesting way to think about it. I most enjoy the fact that I've been lucky to choose problems that have continued to open up as time goes on, and uh, it might just be that you know we started studying something. Uh, 40 years ago where there was so little known and where so few scientists were following it that we had an opportunity to really explore many facets of the problem and uh, it's never run out of gas you know there's there's always there's always been a surprise at each turn um, as we began to develop molecular tools to work on these clocks other laboratories became interested in applying those tools to their own systems. And so you get, you get it's like ripples where the amount of, the, the insights that you get are amplified by, by the, uh, uh, those taking uh, their own uh, directions with these um, initial findings. And, I, and there are always, it, it seems that, the, it, that there's always triggering new new facets of the work. So for example, uh, the human uh, studies have been quite easy to step into just because we know what all the players are. And the tools for doing human biology are now so sophisticated. I can sit at a computer screen and see all the variation um, in the, uh, most of the variation available uh, in the population worldwide because you've got hundreds of thousands of whole genome sequences that you can look at. And with those kinds of numbers, few things escape. Uh, and so uh, uh, there are new ways to ask problems that carry you, carry you deeper and deeper into human biology. And on the other side, uh, while we've looked at circadian clocks, now we're also very much interested in sleep and what controls sleep duration. And there we're finding some what I think are pretty fascinating and unexpected things uh, uh, as well. So it's it's just you you're constantly pushing on the the edges of of, uh, of what you've just learned. And we've been fortunate, as I said, that we just happen to be choosing an area where, uh, as these doors open, we walk through and we find surprises instead of finding uh, a closed door. Yeah, I'd say you were pretty lucky. <laughs> Uh, and uh, at times, uh, when you thought things looked uh, uh, pretty risky, uh, you know, I'm glad you went ahead and stuck with it. It's not as if this was the only uh, the only work we were doing. We sometimes had multiple projects going on that were in uh, uh, different areas. We were looking, for example. Uh, for a while at uh, transposable genetic elements. But, uh, you know, I took some advice from a colleague down the hall uh, 
which I, he could tell I was always already thinking that way, that, you know, this was in the 1980s in transposable elements. I'd done some of this work before going to Rockefeller. Um, it looked like this was something that was headed in a, in a predictable direction. Uh, and uh, perhaps the most exciting work had already been done. And you weren't really perhaps going to find out uh, a new biology that was really going to be uh, 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 really Im impactful. And so I decided to drop that. There was, we were also doing some developmental biology, looking at some uh, genes that regulated uh, the, the construction of the nervous system. We decided, well, this is a really crowded area. And, and uh, uh, so we, we stuck with the more ephemeral uh, at the time, uh, work and it it really blossomed on its own. And so my my uh, my advice to my earlier self is: you were lucky that you you uh, you you chose to uh, some things over over the other, even though at the time it was uh, not so easy to defend. You know? So that might be my advice to. Others, not me, who are in the same situation and wondering, uh, you know, I can I can work on something where everybody appreciates it right now, and I can get a lot of gratification out of that because I get encouragement that this is this is uh, I'm doing the right thing. But maybe that's not the encouragement you want. Mm -hmm.